Thanks for joining us at Salvation Studio House. My name is Marjorie McHugh. We're so glad that you've been watching these videos on the life and death of Mr. Badman, written by John Bunyan. And today we have a great program lined up. We're on chapter 16. His pious wife dies brokenhearted, her deathbed charge to her family. You can read about it on pages 101 to 103. Again, if you haven't gone to our website, salvationstudiohouse.com, do so. There you'll be able to download the PDF onto your um, PC to be able to read the whole book. Anyhow, today is an awesome program about um, the godly wife, Mr. Badman's godly wife that he had. And you're going to see her characteristics and what the Word has to say about godly women. And also the choices that a man and a woman make, uh, whether they choose to lose follow the Lord or not and follow his words and listen to godly counsel. I'd like to start though by reading what attentive and wise men say. How did his good wife take it when she saw that he had not mended his ways, but returned like a dog to his vomit? Why, it broke her heart. It was a worse disappointment to her than the cheating he engaged in to get her in marriage. At least she took it to heart and could not deal with well with it. You must think that she had sent up many a prayer to God for him before, even all the time he had behaved so badly towards her. And now, when she was so frightened in his sickness and wanted to live and get better, poor woman, she thought that the time had come for God to answer her prayers. Talks about like a dog returning to its vomit. That's how it's compared to what Mr. Badman did. It says in Proverbs 26, 10 through 12, The great God who formed everything gives the fool his hire and the transgressor his wages. As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Do you see a wise man in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. So we see the comparison, and it's really repulsive, I'm sure, if you have a pet and you know exactly what we're talking about when a dog returns to its vomit. It is not a pretty sight, and that's how a fool returning to his folly, his former lifestyle, is compared to. Mr. Wiseman goes on to say, Indeed, she didn't show her gladness and whisper it out among her friends, but when she saw herself disappointed by her husband turning rebel again, she could not bear up under it, but fell into a lingering fever and in a few weeks gave up the ghost. So regardless of all the problems that she had lived, um, her godless husband, her children, only one of her children ended up following the Lord. She kept her faith in Christ Jesus. It was like she set her face like a flint towards the Father and towards heaven, and she did not give up hope. But you know what she was dead to? She was dead to self. It says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Mrs. Badman, she took up her cross and followed Christ, regardless of everything that it cost her, she chose to follow the Lord. Let's read about what the rewards of heaven are for her in Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, and the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks of a better thing than that of Abel. It also talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 56. So when this incorruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? 
O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So in the natural, you could look at this wife that she looked like she was on the bad end of the stick. You could say that she didn't look too victorious, right? She had suffered so many things. She had suffered adulteries, too numerous to count. She had suffered um, from her children rebelling against the Lord. And all of this left her broken hearted. But according to the word of God, she was victorious. She bore her cross with the joy set before her. And not only for that of herself, but in prayer and in faith, believing for her family, she stood in the gap all of her life. Let's look at Revelation 21, 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So in her case, there would be no more adulteries, there would be no more persecutions, there would be no more anguish of soul, there would be no more pain because everything had passed away and now she was living eternally with Jesus Christ, the rock of her salvation. So how many Christian wives are out there today? And you might be able to identify with this if you're married and you've maybe married the wrong man. Maybe you were bamboozled and hoodwinked like Mrs. Badman was. Somebody sought you out just because you had money or just because you were the most beautiful woman or many other reasons that you could have been hoodwinked into a marriage that now as a Christian, you're standing and you're standing and you're standing. You became unequally yoked and you become the mother of, of children who are following after their father's example and they're not following after your example. I hope you take heart today to see that your, your labor, if you've repented and you've recognized, God, I blew it in this marriage, but I am gonna stand for my husband and for my children and I'm gonna do the righteous and, and the right thing and I'm gonna stand in the gap for them. I think you're gonna be encouraged today. Let's look at what Jesus says in Matthew 10, 35 to 37. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me or is not worthy of me. You know, this is a really heavy word, and Jesus even said, he says, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. You're going to be divided. And why is that division coming? It's only through Jesus Christ, because he knew that there were going to be those in the family that are going to follow Christ, and there were going to be those in a family who would deny Christ. And that brings a spiritual conflict. That brings a spiritual division. And yet in the midst of that, he's given us his name and power and authority and his mercy to be able to walk the walk that he has called us to walk, to die to self. That's the whole message of the gospel is to live a crucified life. Once we, we become a Christian, we are to die to ourself, our flesh, the lusts of the flesh, and we are to pick up our cross and follow Christ. You know what? Mrs. Badman had every legal, biblical right to divorce her husband, didn't she? She ha it said in the Bible that she could legally divorce her husband because of all of the adulteries that he had committed. But you know what her hope was? Her hope was that in the midst of her character and her, the light in her life, that her husband would come to repentance and that her children would come to repentance. That's what her hope was. She was living the crucified life of, of, for, as a mother and as a wife. So we have to remember that Mrs. Badman was in the situation that she was, and we've talked about this on previous programs, because she did not discern her husband's motives when she got married. She, it seems like she didn't seek out godly counsel, pastoral counsel, to say, would you pray with me and um, let's find out what's, if I'm to marry Mr. Badman. Everything seems to be good on the surface. 
but yet at the heart of things. So there wasn't discernment. So in essence, she was reaping what, you know, she, she sowed. She wasn't sowing to the spirit when she got married. And she ended up uh, marrying a man who was masquerading Christianity to get her money. And you know what? This can go, go for men and women. We always like to use this message as a mirror to herself. It can apply to men and to women. Being um, hoodwinked, being bamboozled, uh, going on and, and thinking that you're, uh, you're marrying the right person when in essence you've been tricked. Many women today are courting Mr. Badman. You know, and some people call it missionary, you know, kind of missionary evangelism. I was like, well, if I date this guy long enough or if I date this girl long enough, I know they're going to come around. I just feel it in my heart. They're going to come around. But the Bible is very clear. It says, do not be unequally yoked. You cannot mix the two. You have to know when you're going into a marriage that that person is born again. You need to fast. You need to pray. You need to get godly counsel. So I, I believe that's a word for somebody today is don't just have that hope in your heart. But no, beyond a shadow of a doubt, no, this is the person. And then be faithful and committed to walk it out. You know, the following scripture that I'm going to read talks about um, false prophets, but it can even be applied to Mr. Badman because he wore religion, as we've talked in other programs, like a cloak. He put it on when it suited him. He cover, covered himself in the cloak of religion when it was out for his interests. In this case, it was for the money and for the prestige that came with marrying this rich woman. So it says in 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing in this uh, if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So we see that Mr. Badman's works were evil. You know, the Apostle Peter, he, he gives a real clear admonition to uh, women in 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6. And you know, I, I don't hear this really preached a lot in the pulpits anymore. And I think it's because the culture that we're living in with, um, with women's rights, with feminism, with all of these equal rights, it's like you can't talk plainly about what the Bible says. And so many things are going on that should probably not be going on. But I'd like to read that this exemplary um, characteristics described um, in uh, 1 Peter 3, 1 to 6 about wives. It says, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observed your chaste conduct, accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid of any terror. So we see that that really applies to Mrs. Badman. She had an ungodly husband and through her, her whole life was really an example of what a Christian wife ought to be. And I'd like to encourage wives out there today to take this scripture to heart, to really just say, Holy Spirit, help me to be this kind of a wife in the midst of a, a time and a season and a generation that we're living in where that and marriage is being so, so undermined. We hear so much about my rights in our culture today, don't we? Everything is about my rights. And as a Christian, we have laid down our rights, haven't we? We've laid down our rights and we've taken up the cross. Jesus says in Matthew 19, 1 to 10, and I'm not going to read all of it, but it talks, Jesus is talking here about um, adultery and divorce. It says, so the Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made 
at, made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of, of divorce and to put her away? And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, well, it is better not to marry. Talks about the hardness of heart. But you know what? Jesus even ups the ante, he, like he always does in Matthew 18, um, 21 to 22, where it talks about even, um, it says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say it to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. So it's talking about a brother or a sister. How many times do I forgive the person who is sinning against me? But you know what? This also goes and applies heavily in marriage. A wife forgiving her husband and a husband forgiving his wife. Not taking count of how many times you've done it in the day, but all the time. And this is what Mrs. Badman did. She continually walked in a spirit of forgiveness. We're to forgive so that we can be forgiven. Mrs. Badman was laying everything out on the line and she was forgiving her husband in spite of all of the abuse, in spite of all of the, um, the things that went contrary uh, and the adulteries that he had. She had the right to divorce him, but she didn't. And you know, probably a lot of people were giving her ungodly counsel also. They were probably saying, Mrs. Badman, just, you know, forget it. Uh, you know, you're getting persecuted and things aren't going right for you. You have every right and every, all to be able to divorce your husband, but she didn't. So I think we have a lot to be able to see from her life. You know, she wasn't able to go to church. She wasn't able to pay her tithes. There were multiple reasons why she would have and could have left her husband. But she gave, forgave him and she submitted herself to the word of the Lord. You know, it, you have all the biblical rights to be able to do, if you're in a situation today where you know that this is happening in your marriage, and it's clear in the Bible what it says, you do have your biblical rights, but in the long run, you really have to know what the Holy Spirit is saying. And this was a choice that Mrs. Badman made. She knew she'd gotten hoodwinked into the marriage, now she had to deal with the consequences of it, and she chose to stay in the marriage. So the choice really is yours. So let's go on to see what Jesus said uh, regarding adultery in Matthew 5, 27 to 28. You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks upon a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So you've already committed adultery if you've lusted after a person, the Bible says. And again, this can go for a man or a woman. You're, you've already committed it in your heart. Jesus always ups the ante. He always is looking at the heart, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's what's going on inside of the heart that Jesus is always looking at. Committing adultery, unfortunately, is something that has become very prevalent in the church. And it's so sad to see that. And I believe it's a challenging time for us to pick up our Bibles and dust them off and say, what does the Bible have to say about marriage? And what does it have to say about adultery? You know, it could be uh, the roots of it. You could be able to have opened the door through, um, through pornography, through flirting. I, I, you see it all the time. I see it off, often. You know, men and women flirting with people who are not their spouses, they're, they're flirting, they're looking at them as they're walking down the street, they're taking a second glance. So it's something that they're doing in their heart. And you know what, if you do it long enough in your heart, eventually it's going to manifest. 
Jesus was clear. It, if, if it's going on inside of the heart, it's going to be acted out in one way or another. As a, as a Christian, again, Mrs. Badman chose to live out her Christianity in front of her husband and in front of her family. You know, in the natural, if you look at it, she wouldn't, Mrs. Badman would not have necessarily been a, a poster girl for women's rights, would she have? Today, everything is about the rights, my rights, my rights, women's rights, and everything like that. And I think that's why we're seeing such a, uh, an attack on, on marriage. So what's the eternal perspective on all of this? As a result of Mrs. Badman's prayers, she knew that the day that her husband and her children stood before the judgment seat of Christ, she and herself, she would be able to say, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And her husband would have had to say, you know what, my wife prayed for me, but I chose a different, I chose a different path. So her prayer is the eternal side of all of this. And that's what we always have to keep in perspective when we're talking about the things of the Lord, the eternal side, what we're doing here on earth, the decisions that we're making here on earth will affect our eternal salvation. Jesus gave her the choice to take an easy road to leave the marriage, but she chose to take up her cross and follow Christ. She chose a difficult road and some of you women are maybe having to choose a difficult road, but you know what? God's mercy is there for you. His grace is there to enable you to stand and having done everything to stand, and your rewards are being laid up for you in heaven. I'd like to read what Mrs. Badman says, because some of you could be even questioning your prayers, like why keep on praying? Why keep on standing in the gap? Why is God even hearing my prayers? Are they really worth anything? But I'd like to read what uh, what it says in the story. It says, I have prayed often for my husband that he might be converted, but there has been no answer from God in the matter. Are my prayers lost? Are they forgotten? Are they thrown over the bar? No, they are hanging on the horns of the golden altar, and I will have the benefit of them myself the moment I enter the gates in which the righteous nation that keeps truth shall enter. Oh yes, I say, I shall have the benefit of them. I can say, as holy David said, and I can say of my husband, as David said of his enemies, as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. My prayers are not lost and my tears are in God's bottle. So in closing today, just like we read what Mrs. Badman said, she didn't question at all the effectiveness of her prayers. You know, it says in the word that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. She knew that her prayers had availed much. She knew that she had filled the cups of intercession uh, in heaven with her prayers, standing in the gap for her children. And she knew that when she came to be judged by the Lord and to receive her rewards, she would know that I've stood for my family, I have, I've made amends, I've confessed my sins, and she was in right standings before the Lord. You know what, I'd encourage you today, if you find yourself in this situation, whether a man or a woman, you could have a, a, a wife that's not been faithful, on, faithful with you, and, and, or maybe you are a man or a woman and your husband has not been faithful. Today, I want to encourage you that God is there to help you out and that your prayers avail much. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every person that's watching this program today. You know what's going on in their lives. You know the situation that they find themselves in. And I pray, Father, that they would be encouraged by what Mrs. Badman did. She stood in the gap, but she didn't give up. She loved her husband, she loved her children, she prayed for them and she forgave them continually. I pray, Father, that each person watching would be able to have that conviction and that assurance in their hearts that having done everything to stand, that they stand, that they fight the good fight of faith and that they don't give in. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thanks for joining us on this program. Salvation Studio House, go to our website, salvationstudiohouse.com to watch the rest of the videos on the life and death of Mr. Badman and read up on our illustrated messages. Thanks for watching this program. God bless you.